Hey guys, so what you're looking at on screen is a picture of a new arrival. It's a baby giraffe that was born on our farm probably in the last um, two or three weeks. Um, I must say on my phone, this picture looked a lot more, um, a lot more sharp, sharper than it does here. But anyway, you get a you get an idea of of what's going on. Uh, my father took this picture, I think, on his phone, and he said that the little baby came right up to his vehicle. Um, obviously, it hasn't learned to be afraid of people, and so you know it's quite tame. So um, I wanted to share that with you. I actually really wanted to. Uh, have my own photos. I mean, I, I did go to the farm um, uh, independently, and um, I took my my camera, and and I just couldn't find the I couldn't. Well, the baby and the mother were sort of hidden away. Um, there's a bit more to that story. I'll um, I'll uh, I'll share that with you guys a little bit later. So, anyway, spring is springing in South Africa. Um, and Africa, um, the peach trees outside, well, one of them is just full of buds. I actually wanted to show you guys um, footage of that. I'm just really, really busy tonight. Um, and uh, funny enough, the other tree doesn't have a single leaf coming out, a single bud coming out, whereas the, the one that's on this side has got buds and leaves. It's just incredible how a tree can be distinctive from another tree. Um, I want to have a look at uh, what you guys said in the polls. Uh, hello, everyone. Let's just see who's here. By the way, um, Jelsey has, uh, I think I've got another image here that I can share. I hope it's okay that I do share it. Jelsey, if it's not, just tell me very soon. One, two, three. Tell me, come. Um, by the way, Jelsey's got her Team Peachtree shirt. Some nice flowers in the background there. Um, yeah, so she's got hers. Have you got yours? Cool. Thanks a lot, Jelsey. Cool. Okay, so we, we're going to uh, have a look at um, a different website for a change. Because what we want to investigate in, and it's kind of a true crimey uh, episode of Team Peach Tree this time, we, we kind of want to try and figure out in the, what, I, what, what do I call it, the, um, in the post-meditation phase, whether it corresponds to this idea, this impression of, well, did Van Gogh cut off his ear or did Gauguin do something? You know, in other words, in the post, in the aftermath, in the post meditation, what does that look and feel like? And so we're going to be dealing with that here. We're going to be literally just looking at the correspondence between Gauguin and Van Gogh in the aftermath. And I think one of the questions you can ask is how many letters are there, for example, in the first year? Are they are they writing to one another like 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 they are still huge friends? Is there any acknowledgement in the letters? Um, are they cryptic in the letters? If so, in what way? So we kind of want to look at that. By the way, do you like my shirt? Um, this 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 is a shirt from Jackson Hole, and this is a cap from Zion National Park. Um, I, I actually put on a different cap um, and and then I, my face looked really pink on screen. So so that's, that's actually why I'm wearing this one. Um, so although we have our beliefs, what we want to try and do is, even though we think we know what happened, let's try and just keep an open mind and see where the information takes us. Okay. That's cool. Thanks a lot, Chelsea. Well, I like your shirt as well. Okay. So I think the, most of the class are present. Um, 
18, 19 of, of you guys are here. It's usually around about 30 or so. So I think most of us are here. So I, I think let's let's get going with with the lesson. So um, so the, the question I asked in terms of the poll, I want to have a look at that poll now, is, and you follow my thinking, if Vincent cut off his own ear and that kind of repelled Gauguin, that drove Gauguin away, in other words, Gauguin was kind of getting cold feet about the whole thing, about the whole Yellow House deal, he kind of wanted to leave anyway, and then maybe Vincent cut off his ear in, uh, what's the word, in in a, like, almost like out of frustration or desperation or something, and then that literally drove Gauguin away. He was like, jeepers, you are losing it, I'm out of here. In a situation like that, who, and it's a subjective thing, I mean, you can argue it both ways, but logically, sensibly, who would be the most likely to write to the other first, right? What do you guys think in a situation like that? I mean, you could certainly argue it in the opposite direction, say, you know, that human nature is not like a machine. You know, it could, it could, you know, someone could do something unexpected, and that's certainly true. But in a just in a basic sense, you know, if you just imagine Van Gogh did cut off his ear and that drove Gauguin away, and you know how much Vincent Van Gogh wanted all of this to work. You know, he wanted the yellow house. We know how much, you know, if we follow these letters. Um, not only that, um, he seemed to really get along with Gauguin and he, he painted very well while Gauguin was around. You know, he's the quality of his work seemed to improve, right? So in that context, who do you think would have written to whom first? So Snow Lion says, I think Gauguin, I think Van Gogh wrote to Gauguin, but I stand to be corrected. So that's not the question I'm asking. The question I'm asking is, if Van Gogh cut his own ear off, what do you think would have happened next in terms of correspondence? Do you think he would have written to Gauguin? Or do you think Gauguin would have written to him? Do you guys follow what I'm saying? Uh, Robbie Robin says Gauguin probably wouldn't have made the effort to write first. Now, that's actually quite a good point in general. In other words, if you say, you know what, Gauguin was less inclined to write letters anyway. So so just in terms of statistics, just in terms of the likelihood of him writing, wouldn't you agree that the likelihood is less that, that he would write back, right? So uh, like just in a general sense, Van Gogh is writing letters all the time. So just in that sense, if you just take all the dynamics away, I think you would say, that he would um, that he would he would have written first. Does that make sense? Uh, I think he did call it an accident. So the the point I'm trying to make is and and follow try and follow the reasoning here. If Van Gogh had cut off his own ear and that had driven Gauguin away. You can imagine that Van Gogh would have written to Gauguin after a day or two or three or four, you know, when he'd recovered from his emotions and when he'd kind of settled, right? You can imagine that he would have written to Gauguin and said, cheapest dude, I'm sorry, whatever, whatever, whatever. Does that make sense? In other words, do you follow that? Or do you think it's more likely that Gauguin having seen this bloody um, drama, uh, do you think he would have sat in, in Paris or in Britain and written back and said, hey, are you okay? Was he that kind of person? Was he a caring, considerate guy? You know, what do you think? Just which one do you think is more likely? 
Okay, so now we're going to try and answer that question. I just want to see what I've got here. Um, okay, so so this is um, a letter from Vincent to Gauguin. Let's try and um, make it a bit bigger. And it's very early. It's Friday, the 4th of January, right? And he's saying, I'm taking advantage of my first trip out of the hospital to write to you a few most sincere and profound words of friendship. And now the question is, did he write this letter like uh, or, or out of his own or did um, Gauguin write to him first and he responded, right? So let me see if I can uh, find uh, find some other letter. Just have a look over here, Gauguin. So if we go over here, um, Paul Gauguin to Vincent van Gogh, uh, there it is, okay, to Paul Gauguin, Paul Gauguin to Vincent van Gogh, Paris, Tuesday, 8th, Wednesday, and 16th, January, okay, so I must say this, this isn't quite how I thought this would go, um, when I first looked through this, I was under the impression that Gauguin had written to him first, but let's just have a look here. So, um, so this is the first letter. So Vincent writes to him first, um, and it's a very short letter, but it's actually kind of an accusatory letter. He says to him, was my brother Theo's journey really necessary? And then he also says, at least reassure him completely and yourself, please. Trust that, in fact, no evil exists in this best of, of both worlds where everything is always for the best, right? Okay, so that's actually the first communication between the two of them. Um, as we said, statistically, it makes sense that Van Gogh wrote to Gauguin, but he he kind of, it's kind of cryptic where he says, tell me, was my brother Theo's journey really necessary? And so doesn't that convey a little bit of a sense of um, opprobrium, uh, resentment, um, is a little put out, well, probably more than a little put out, but is is certainly communicating it in a euphemistic way, I would say. Another question is, um, what does Gauguin say in response? And so this is his response. Let's just have a look. Um, where is it? Uh, okay, so the next letter is this one. From Paul Gauguin to Vincent van Gogh. It's so strange that there's no salutation, right? So part of the letter is missing. And, and one, do, one does have to wonder um, what is going on here. And I, I'm not trying to be funny when I say, you know, you know, with um, the diary of Anne Frank, some of the letters that Anne Frank wrote of, of, have been purposefully withheld by the Frank family. Um, because they include references to her sexuality that they just felt was was uh, private, I guess, and they just felt, well, this doesn't this doesn't need to be part of the narrative, right? In other words, you, there's a certain amount of controlling of the narrative, editing of the narrative by the family because of how the public might perceive it. And I just wonder whether there's something like that going on here, because um, the letter just starts, your sunflowers on a yellow background. So where's the rest of this letter? And it's a very important letter. It's, it's 
basically Gauguin's first letter to Vincent following the air incident. So where's the start of it? What happened to it? There, there it is, Paul Gauguin to Vincent van Gogh, Tuesday the 8th and Wednesday the 16th. So they can't even date it accurately. They're saying it's somewhere in the middle of the month. So let's have a look at his tone. Bear in mind, Vincent wrote a really short letter. Let's have a look at the tone. He says, um, which I regard as a perfect page of an essential Vincent style. At your brother's home, I saw your sower, which is very good, as well as a yellow still life, apples and lemons. Your brother gave me a lithograph reproduction of an old painting of yours, Dutch, very interesting as regards color in the drawing. In my studio next to your portrait. So I don't know if you picking this up, he, he seems to be being very friendly, very complimentary. Um, and then he says, the grape harvests are totally covered in scales as a result of the white, which is separated. I've stuck all of it back down using a process shown to me by the reliner. If I tell you about it, it's because the thing is easy to do and can be very good. So he's kind of just making small talk. Um, for those of your canvases that need retouching, you stick newspapers on your canvas with flour paste. Once dry, you put your canvas on a smooth board with very hot irons, you press down hard on it. All the breaks in your color will remain, but will be flattened down and you will have a very fine surface. Afterwards, you soak your paper covering well and take off all the paper. That's largely the whole secret of relining. And then this is the critical paragraph. He says, thank Roulon for thinking of me. I've indeed received my stretcher keys. And then here he says, look at this. At the, net, at the next opportunity, if you can send me by parcel post my two fencing masks and gloves, which I left on the shelf in the little upstairs room. And now that, that does make you wonder, why did he leave behind fencing masks? Obviously, if he had fencing masks, he had fencing um, swords, right? And, but why did he leave it behind in the upstairs room? Why, why did he leave it behind? Um, bear in mind, he took one of Vincent's sunflower paintings, right? So it's not like he ran out of there in a, in a, in a hurry and left everything behind. He had time to take one of Vincent's sunflower paintings. So why does he leave behind the fencing masks and gloves? Why specifically that? Zircon says they were fencing. I don't think they were fencing. I think one of them was fencing. Yeah, because he was in a hurry to leave. And it doesn't it make sense that they were having an argument and in the middle of the argument, Gauguin um sort of leaves and i don't mean um it's actually difficult to think about this when does he take the painting does he take it while van gogh is um after the i mean must happen after the incident does he take it while van gogh is lying in bed uh, kind of comatose does he take it on his way out after what has happened I mean it's it, it, and, and that's just if you just think about it when the Gauguin leaves no matter who cut off Van Gogh's ear um, Gauguin leaves and he takes Van Gogh's sunflowers and I think it's without asking him and so you kind of you kind of got to ask the question: Did he really take the like, like? Where was Van Gogh when he took it? Was Van Gogh in the house? If he was in the house, was he not conscious? And so why wouldn't he ask him? You know, that does does make you wonder. Um, I think the 
issue with the fencing equipment is, I mean, the masks and gloves. It's two fencing masks and gloves. Actually, does make you wonder: Did did the two of them sometimes practice? I mean, it's in the house. Did so? Did they sometimes practice? Um, probably was quite difficult to carry if you were if you were heading to the station with all that you could carry um, and you've already got a painting in your hand. Um, yeah. The other thing that I think is interesting is, did he leave the swords behind? And if he did leave the swords behind, why doesn't he mention them? If he didn't leave the swords behind, then surely Theo saw the swords and, and was aware of the swords. But I kind of feel like he is asking for his fencing equipment, but he just doesn't reference it in the letter. Do you follow? I mean, let's let's for the sake of argument say that Gauguin did cut off Vincent's ear, right? Then Vincent's brother comes to all, Theo comes to all. Do you think Gauguin is going to go with Theo, given that his brother's ear has been cut off, sliced off. Do you think Gauguin is going to go with the brother and have this fencing equipment sort of on his lap in the train going back to Paris? I mean, that's quite a long way for Theo not to go, hang on, are you, are you telling me that he cut off his own ear, but but what's that you've got on your lap? I mean, that, that thought would have to occur to him. And so doesn't he leave that behind because Theo's there? What do you guys think? Let's have a look at some of your comments. Um, Bruni says he's a thief. Um, Lana says all of the fencing equipment should have been okay, I've, I've looked at that okay okay so let's go on to the next letter let's just see which one it is okay so this is from Theo and Joe to Vincent van Gogh. I don't know why I was under the impression that Gauguin was the first to write. So anyway, so did you guys know this? That in the middle of this whole thing, Theo got engaged to Joe, right? In the middle of this whole kind of conflagration. And they announced their engagement in January 1889. So you can also understand why Theo sort of raced to all and then raced back. Um, you know, it was kind of Christmas and New Year, and he's about to get engaged, and he kind of doesn't really want his um, fiance to be put off by what, what is happening. That's also potentially another reason why Theo maybe didn't investigate it more than perhaps he should have. In other words, if Theo wanted to get engaged and that was all happening, really it's happening in early January. There it says, can you see the Wednesday 9 January, right? You can kind of imagine that um, if Vincent was aware of this engagement, that, that he wouldn't want to jeopardize that either by sort of saying, well, who knows? It's quite a difficult one. On the one hand, um, him saying he cut off his own ear, is that really going to endear Theo's fiance to the brother? On the other hand, if Gauguin, who's got this really important business relationship with his brother, um, if it becomes this legal matter, it can become very complicated right that's that's the other way of arguing it what a way to begin a new life yeah uh lana says how would the paintings have been packaged 
Lana, I really don't think the sword should be packaged with the painting, um, you know, because swords could damage the painting. So I think they would be packaged uh, separately. Um, it's difficult to say. Um, it depends on whether the canvas is rolled. I doubt whether that's the case. I kind of get the idea that it's a stretched canvas that is in some kind of protective um, covering. So it's something that looks like a sort of a DHL package in a sense. You know, it's not it's not like a circular thing. Um, that's a good point. Why would Theo not notice the? He might. He might. Um, Gauguin might say, uh, you know, Vincent gave this to me as a goodbye present. You know, I'm sorry you're leaving. Please take this, these sunflowers. Maybe that's what he said. I don't know. Okay. So anyway, this adds like a, a layer of intrigue to the whole thing. The the fact that Theo is kind of having his fairy tale in the middle of this nightmare. I mean, that's literally what's what's taking place. Okay. So this is sent uh, January 1889, um, specifically the 9th of January. Okay, here it says sent on about the 6th of January, the printed uh, announcement of the engagement. See, now this is not mentioned in the, the other archive, uh, unless I missed it. So what's this? Um, so here's a letter to Theo um, on the 9th of January, and this is from Vincent. Okay, so he says, My dear Theo, even before receiving this very moment, your kind letter, I received a letter from your fiancé this morning announcing the engagement. So I've already replied to her with my sincere congratulations as I repeat them here to you. My fear that my indisposition might prevent your very necessary journey, which I've hoped for you, I've hoped for so much and for so long. Now that this fear has disappeared, I feel completely normal. This morning, I went to the hospital again to have my wound dressed and walked for an hour and a half with the house physician. And we talked a little about everything, even natural history. Then he says, what you tell me about Gauguin gives me enormous pleasure. That's to say, he hasn't abandoned his plan to return to the tropics. That's the right path for him. I think I can see clearly into his plan and I approve, approve of it with all my heart. Naturally, I have regrets about it. But you can understand that provided it goes well for him, that's all I need. If you can do so, talk a little to CM about the future of his business and the fact that his son can continue it, provided CM himself does his full duty as regards listening to you and putting you and his son together. All the same, CM must wish that the firm he found, is this, um, is this? so CM is Kord van Gogh, um, it's either the brother of Van Gogh or his uncle. I think it's his uncle. Then he says, then Tierstig must admit the impressionists or at least believe in E. de la Croix and then Tierstig and you joining hands would be a great force that Boussard would have to reckon with. Now, can you see how weird this is it's like van gogh has lost his ear and no one's talking about it he's not talking about it gauguin's not talking about it and his brother's not talking about it and it's all kind of been swept under the carpet because well i don't know if it's because but uh in the context of theo getting engaged but isn't it bizarre like imagine you're on social media and you've lost a toe or a finger do you think you'd mention it at some point or would you say look at that pretty butterfly going by there well that's what van gogh is doing 
Although he does say here, when I came out of the hospital, I had quite a few things to pay. And while they aren't at all urgent for a few days, I'll be pleased if you could send me about 50 francs within the next few days. The mistake in Paul Gauguin's calculations was, in my opinion, that he's a little too accustomed to closing his eyes to the inevitable expenses of house rental, charwoman, and a whole heap of earthly things of that kind. D does that seem like he's um, genuinely still Gauguin's friend? I mean, that, that word pal, it's not friend. The mistake in my friend Gorgan's calculations is it's kind of a, seems like a sarcastic word, doesn't it? Um, okay, so, sorry, uh, let's have a look at your comments. It does seem like don't ask, don't tell. Uh, Magical Hel Helen says, I also think that for whatever reason, Gauguin did look on his fleeing as an escape, whether he thought Van Gogh was crazy or he wanted to get away with the painting. Um, okay. Yeah, it does seem like classic denial. Okay, let's continue. Okay, let's bring this up. Okay, so he says, he's talking about him being a little too accustomed to closing his eyes to the inevitable expenses. Now, whatever you want to say about Kogan and Van Gogh, um, don't you kind of get the impression that that they argued about money? That, and bear in mind, we all know that if you think back to the letters that we dealt with, 67, 68, 69, remember Gauguin arrived in all like on the on the sort of gravy train of success. He just sold a painting, and then I think he sold two more, and then they were going to go and sort of to the, the brothels, right? And I think you could see it from a mile away that Vincent van Gogh was the kind of guy who's extremely, um, what's the word, thrifty, right? He's a very thrifty self, um, uh, what's, what's the word for like, Yeah, he's kind of selfless, but but the point is that he basically lives like a beggar in a way. You know, he, he lives in a very cheap way. He, he drinks coffee. He, you know, he, he will spend more on art, on 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 um, paints than on meals. Right? Do you get that impression with Gauguin? I mean, with Gauguin, if if you think of the chair Vincent painted to depict Gauguin. It's like kind of luxurious, right? And um, and so in the house situation, you can just see how that would be, there would be a lot of arguments. Gauguin wants to have a, a three course meal and a nice Chianti or whatever it is, right? A nice bottle of wine. And, Gauguin, and, and Vincent wants to keep expenses down, right? Vincent's used to living like that, and Gauguin thinks that this is going to be a big holiday. Frugal is a good word, yeah. Frugal is a very good word. Okay, so they probably argued about money, and he says, now all these things weigh a little heavily on the shoulders of the two of us, but once, and I, Yeri means, Yeri means Theo and me, not, not, Gauguin and, and me, right? He says, but once we bear them, other artists could lodge with me without having those costs. So 
think about that as well is this idea that Vincent is still at the mercy of his brother. So does Vincent really want to say to Theo, like Gabby Petito, does she want to say to the, the police officers or her parents, um, Brian hit me, Brian hurt me, um, I'm scared. Um, well, even though that's true, does she want to say that? Well, what will happen is because someone else is paying the bills in a way and because she needs uh, Brian to be there to drive and to take photos and to, to get the social media show on the road, she, she needs to not be honest about it. The minute she's honest, that whole show is over. And I believe the same thing um, counts for Vincent. Because his brother's paying for everything, he says to his brother, me and Gauguin argued, and then Gauguin cut off my ear. His brother's going to be like, I don't think it's going to work you being with another artist. But if he says, well, I cut off my own ear, like Gabby Petito said, oh, well, I cut myself when I climbed through the window. Oh, so you did it to yourself. Oh, that's okay. So if he did it to himself, well, then, okay, then it's fine. As long as you can take care of yourself, well, then we can have another artist stay there. But as, as soon as he acknowledges that he fought with another artist, his brother's going to be like, I don't know whether I should keep supporting you. You know, you're a, you're a difficult guy. You don't get along with other people. That's what I think. That's what I think. Okay, so let's go back to this. Um, let's make it a bit bigger. Okay. He says, I've just been told that in my absence, the owner of my house here apparently made a contract with a fellow who has a tobacco shop to turn me out and give him the tobacconist a house. You can imagine that this is devastating news. That worries me a little, for I'm not inclined to have myself turned out of this house almost shamefully, when it was I who had it repainted inside and out and had gas put in, uh, etc. That's the other thing is, if you look at the premeditation, the, the thinking before the incident, Van Gogh put so much effort into that house. Is he really the one that wants to throw it away? I mean, Gauguin is the one that left. Gauguin is the one that cut ties, right? And even now, Vincent doesn't want to give up on this fairy tale. He says, I was the one who made it a, a, a habitable house. Um, and it's been locked up and uninhabited for quite a long time before that. And I took, on, I took it on in very poor condition. This is to warn you that perhaps at Easter, for example, if the owner persists, I'll ask you for advice about it. And that in all of this, I consider myself merely an agent defending the interests of our artist friends. That is exactly what he's doing. He's defending the interests of this artistic campaign, right? And obviously here he thinks all of this is going to continue until Easter. Well, he's completely wrong. Uh, this is going to be over very soon. He's going to be at the asylum very, very soon. He says, besides, it's more than likely that water will flow into the bridge between now and then. And the main thing is not to worry about it. Well, he's saying to his brother, don't worry about it. But of course, things are pretty bad. Then he says, has Bernard uh, returned the Silvestre book to you yet? I'll need the exact title to get those doctors to read this book. Then he has a, um, a self-assessment. Physically, I'm well. The wound is closing very well, and the great loss of blood is balancing out since I'm eating and digesting well. You know, what's quite interesting is he doesn't even mention his ear. He doesn't say, my head hurts. He doesn't say, my hearing is weird. It, it, he, it's very um, indirect and, and sort of, um, yeah, kind of a distant indirect way of referring to his ear. He just calls it the wound. He says, the most fearsome thing is the insomnia, and the doctor didn't talk to me about it, nor have I spoken to him about it, but I'm fighting it myself. I'm fighting this insomnia with a very, very strong dose of camphor in my pillow and my mattress. 
and I recommend it to you if you ever have trouble sleeping. So, so he can't sleep probably because of, I mean, how do you sleep if you've lost one ear? Well, you, you certainly don't sleep on that side. And obviously, if you turn in bed and, you know, you're kind of half asleep and you turn in bed, you're going to wake up with a jolt, right? Um, so he's probably got constant pain and he's got to be very careful not to touch that side of his head against anything because it'll be really, really painful, right? Okay, and then he says, um, I was very fearful of sleeping alone in the house and I felt anxious that I wouldn't be able to sleep. Why would he be afraid of sleeping alone in the house? And I, again, I guess it comes down to the thing of, is he afraid of himself or is he afraid of his fellow man? I felt anxious that I wouldn't be able to sleep, but it went very well and I dared to believe that it won't recur. My suffering in that in that way in the hospital was appalling and yet in the midst of it though i was more than insensible i can tell you as a curiosity that i kept thinking about Dega. now i'm kind of going to be beating on this drum again but does this letter sound like someone who is angry in other words someone who's very emotional resentful anything like that right does it sound like someone who's mad? Because, I mean, that's been, that's the official reason. I mean, if you had to ask someone, why did Van Gogh cut off his ear? Because he was mad. Because he was troubled. Is there any sign of that in this letter? Does he seem overly emotional? Does he seem insensible? Does he seem mad? And th this letter is about two weeks after the fact. It's quite a long letter as well. I mean, it would require a bit of concentration to write it. Anyway, it goes on to say, Gauguin and I talked about Degas before, and I pointed out to Gauguin that Degas had said this, I'm saving myself for the Elysians. Now, it's quite an interesting quote there. Um, now, uh, you who know how subtle Degas is, once you're back in Paris, tell Degas that I admit to you that up until now, I've been powerless to paint them as other than poisonous, the, the woman of all, and that he mustn't believe Gauguin if Gauguin says good things too soon about my work, which has only been done under the influence of illness. It's quite an interesting Bob there. He says, don't believe Gauguin if he says good things too soon about my work. He talks about poisonous, that the women are poisonous. So one of my theories is that Gauguin and Vincent argued over a woman, that perhaps Gauguin brought a woman to the house and either Vincent was jealous or Vincent got drunk who knows? Um, but it, it's quite strong language from Van Gogh. He says, don't believe Gauguin. Is he, and he calls the woman of all poisonous. That's quite a strong statement. Don't believe Gauguin. And then he says, um, now if I recover, I must start again. And I can't again attain those peaks to which sickness imperfectly led me. I wonder what he means by that, by sickness. He talks about the influence of illness. What, what does it say here? Anyway, doesn't really address that. Okay, then he says, I would very much have liked to give another painting to Rave, precisely because I wholly agree with you that it would be good to put Mr. Ray in touch with Rave. 
but you could indeed tell Reve that it would be good to send Mr. Ray back here to the hospital with the doctor's qualification. He's going to try and get. He's very, very useful here and will be will darn well be in need of doctors again here in all in days to come. As long as cholera and the plague and so on continue to menace the area around Marseille. Now Ray, that's Dr. Ray, was born here and would be worthless in Paris or elsewhere. Uh, while once he was armed with the full medical power of Paris, he could perform real miracles here in a time of calamity. Of course, we have no right to get involved in the question of medicine. Only Reve himself will perhaps be of the same opinion. Um, then he says, did you pass through Breda? I'm naturally inclined to think so. Above all, reassure mother about me. Have you seen the portrait of me that Gauguin has? And have you seen the portrait that Gauguin did of himself during those final days? So this is quite interesting where he's actually referencing in a way the way the one is seeing the other and the way the other is seeing him, right? He's talking about this picture. Okay, so that's... What's this? Okay, that's not what I'm looking for. I think you know those portraits to me. Okay. Then he says, if you were to compare this portrait which Gauguin did of himself, then with, with the one I still have of him, which he sent to me from Brittany, in exchange for mine, So I'm not quite used to this uh, format. Um, so he's referring to this picture. He says, if you were to compare this portrait which Gauguin did of himself with the one I still have of him, you would see that all in all he grew more serene here, personally. Okay. So he grew more serene, maybe Van Gogh grew less serene. You anyway, know, that's the, that, that's what he's pitching to his brother. Guess what? Gauguin was actually happy here. Why is he, why is he saying that? Isn't it because he wants Theo to approve the next artist. What have De Haan and Isaacson been doing? I vaguely hope to see them here one day uh, had Gauguin himself stayed longer with me. And with a view to that, I had even rented two little rooms which were, which were coming vacant in the house, which I, I currently have the whole of. The rent is 21 francs 50 a month. I daren't press the point anymore seeing as Gauguin is gone especially when one considers that the journey to the south costs quite a lot. Anyway, give them my kind regards when you see them again. Roulan sends his warm regards. He's very pleased with what you said about him in your letter today. And besides, he amply deserves it. Handshake, and naturally you'll feel how much I wish you good days with your fiancé. Ever yours, Vincent. Warm regards to Andre Bonga if he's there too. Okay. So this is the response from Paul Gauguin to Vincent, and it's written on the 17th of January. Let's um, have a look at what you guys are saying. So something that sort of just crossed my mind, um, to be honest, it doesn't seem very likely, but it's, it's a thought anyway. 
Um, if Gauguin wanted to leave all in a hurry, right? In other words, if he wanted to create a situation where he would have a very quick exit strategy, And, and think a little bit about Lucy Letby in this this instance. In other words, um, Lucy Letby is in a way, to some extent, powerless. And in order to get what she wants, she's got to manipulate the situation, right? If you think about Gauguin, and I realize it's a bit of a strange thought, but could it be that Gauguin felt, I really have got to get out of here him and Vincent were fighting anyway. And if Vincent's injured, isn't that going to summon his brother? And that is then going to be his ticket out of there? Or is that, um, is that an unrealistic way of thinking about it? What I'm trying to say is, was Gauguin that manipulated? It was Gauguin trying to manipulate the situation? Did Gauguin hurt Vincent to get Theo there? And I mean, if you think about it just in a bit more context, you think about if Vincent spoke to Gauguin about sort of lots of anecdotes about their, his past, he probably would have said, how Theo came to see him in the Borinage when he wasn't well, and how Theo came to see him in the hospital in Belgium. Wasn't he in the hospital in Belgium when he wasn't well? Um, yeah, so I don't know. I can't help thinking that, but to be honest, it seems like a little bit of a stretch to think that, well, I'm going to cut your ear off, um, and that's going to bring Theo here, and that's that's how I'm going to get out of here. Um, it's a little bit, uh, I'm not sure if I totally believe that, but, but I think it's possible. Okay, anyway, let's continue. So, so this is a letter from, a very short letter from uh, Paul Gauguin to Vincent. My dear Vincent, don't bother yourself with the studies that are deliberately left in all as not being worth the trouble of transporting them. Do you think he deliberately left those pictures in all? Like, do you think that, bear in mind, um, he was starting to sell his art and he's got an arrangement with Theo, right? Do you really think that he deliberately left his art in all? Then he says, on the other hand, the sketchbooks contain notes which are useful to me, and I accept your offer to send them to me. And then there he mentions it again, as well as the two masks and gloves. And, and again, he mentions it right at the end of the letter. Oh, by the way, also the fencing masks and gloves. So it, it took from, this letter was sent on the 17th of January. It took February, March, April. It took three months for Vincent to actually send this stuff to Gauguin. Three months. Now, again, if the masks are totally kind of innocuous, innocent, and aren't really relevant to what happened to him, why wouldn't he just send it to him? Like you get the idea that Vincent's someone who writes letters pretty often, and he wants a response pretty often, right? So why wouldn't he just send, send it through? On the other hand, um, I suppose you could argue that um, I'm just trying to think 
because I'm going through through something like that myself. Um, there's something I don't want to deal with in my home because it reminds me of of something. I'm just trying to think what it is. Something that I'm supposed to clean up in my home, but it reminds me. It's not it's not that it's dirty. It's just clutter. Um, I'm just trying to think. Anyway, so it may not necessarily be that that he was struck by by a sword. It could just be that it reminds him of the fallout with Gorgad, and it's, it's quite traumatic. Does that make sense? So I guess that's the other possibility. Lana says he's holding them hostage, being resentful for what was done. It might just be that he's... It's very hard for him to look at that again, kind of thing. So um, that's the beginning of the letter. And then he adds kind of a postscript, which is quite long. He says, I regret that I inadvertently took it with all my apologies. Um, and I think that this is a reference to I think it's I'm not quite sure what he's talking about. He says, I regret that I inadvertently took it with me. I've seen Bernard twice since I arrived in Paris. I, I don't know if he's referring, I mean, yeah, it's quite cryptic. I don't know if he's referring yet to the um what do you call it? The sunflowers painting. Anyway, then he says, um, it appears his father is bothering him more and more on account of the painting and the unfortunate letter I wrote to his family. So let's just, uh, how can I get rid of this? Tell me, I'm going to put you down. How do I get rid of this letter? Okay, that, 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 no, that didn't quite work. Um, is it this thing? It says, no, I haven't done any portraits yet, having spent my time on errands. See, the notes are all hidden behind this picture, but I'm not quite sure how to get rid of it. See if I refresh. And then I do this. Um, there we go. Okay, that's what I'm looking for. So he says, this unfortunate letter was the one Gauguin sent to Bernard's sister, Madeleine, in mid-October 1888. And this is quite important. So this unfortunate letter predates the whole ear incident. And what, what is it about? It's about, um, I don't know why my face looks so red. Um, maybe if I do that or that. <laughs> Anyway, um, so this letter to Gauguin's, to Bernard's sister, Madeleine, in mid-October 1888, it predates the whole year incident. He advised her to put off marrying. So Gauguin advised Bernard's sister to put off marrying um, and first earn her own livelihood. Her father then intercepted the letter and wrote an angry letter to Gauguin, who received it in all and forwarded it to Bernard. So while Gauguin was in all, he's kind of ensconced in this weird um, kind of three-way correspondence with Bernard's sister. And he's saying, don't get married, blah, blah, blah. And is, is that possibly why Gauguin wanted to go back? 
because of his romantic feelings for another woman, right? Was he missing Bernard's sister? Um, Suzanne Smith says, for intertextuality, Gauguin left just like Brian Laundry left to clean out. That's, that is quite interesting. That is quite an interesting point. Uh, thanks a lot, Susan. Thanks. And thank you, Robbie Robin. Uh, Robbie, it's been very good, your interest in the Lucy Letby case. That's, that's definitely been interesting. Um, something that I've thought about, but I haven't um, communicated, I haven't really gotten around to it, is just this idea, was Lucy or is Lucy an incel? Is that um, a label that, that applies in her case? Just, just an interesting thought, I think. Yeah, so that could be that could be the case. Okay. So her father was really angry. Um, he according to Bernard, Gauguin had fallen in love with Madeleine in Pont Arvin. So there's what I've just said isn't so crazy. I mean, why is Gauguin like writing to Bernard's sister? It's not because he's a is an active correspondent, right? Because something's going on. Um, she had been there from mid-August to mid-October 1888 and was even intending to elope with her. That's that's right there. He was even intending to elope with her. And so in the middle of all of this, he doesn't have any money, right? And so in the middle of all this, he goes to all where you've got Van Gogh, who's totally like hero worshiping Gauguin and totally is totally focused on doing everything he can do to keep Gauguin comfortable. Meanwhile, Gauguin's heart and mind is somewhere else right? He's in love with someone else, and he doesn't want to be in all. And by the time Christmas comes around, he's like, this is a special time of year. I want to be with her. Isn't that what he's thinking? And so, yeah, you've got an artist, Gauguin, who is interfering with um, Bernard's sister, and Bernard's father and, and the sister's father is very upset about this interest from Gauguin and says her father had forbidden all contact between her and Gauguin. Gauguin must have told Van Gogh about this as emerges from the lack of further explanation in the present letter and the reference to the letter from Bernard's father. So can you see there, there is intrigue, there is very important information that's kind of missing from this correspondence. That's why I say some of the most important stuff here is kind of either cryptic or between the lines. Anyway, he goes on to say, um, so they just refers to, there is the, talk about understatement. All he says is, some, the only reference to all of this drama is, oh, the unfortunate letter I wrote to his family. Look how much hides, look how much resides in those seemingly harmless words, quite incredible. Then he says, no, I haven't done any portraits yet, having spent my time on errands. So yeah, it says, he's reacting to Van Gogh's letter, which is no longer, so something also happened to that letter from Van Gogh, it's gone. What did Van Gogh say in that letter? Why is it gone, right? Um, then he says, now that I have a studio in which I sleep, so Gauguin had been staying with the Schuffenecker family since his return to Paris. Uh, then he says, I began a series of lithographs to be published in order to get myself known. Let's see if we can... Um, see them. It's not terribly, terribly good. Anyway, that's what he, I guess, was working on. 
Anyway, he says, um, I'm going to buckle down to the portraits of the whole Schuffenecker family, he, his wife, and his two children in vermilion aprons. There, there's that. Then he says, um, it's darn cold in Paris at the moment. In addition, I've amused myself doing, is it croquet at the market? I'm not quite sure what that refers to. And I'm going to get some porters from the market to pose with their big hats, carrying sacks and sides of meat. I'm carried away at top speed by it. I don't know if I'll go to Brussels. Uh, everything will depend on the money situation. Um, and that's as clear as mud. In any case, if I go there, I'll remember the advice you gave me about it. I don't know, for example, if my weak voice will be heard. In any case, the common good interests me enormously, and I'll try to do the right thing. Now, the other thing that stands out, so in other words, if some of these letters are cryptic and you're not getting the full story, well, you get a little bit of an extra dimension to what's going on through their art. And one of the things that's quite interesting with um, Gauguin's art of Van Gogh is that he depicts Van Gogh as a martyr. And so the question is, is he a martyr, like in a, in a real sense? In other words, does he take on the sins of Gauguin and the sins of Dr. Gachet in a, in a real martyr sense? In other words, someone does something, but instead of that person getting into trouble, Van Gogh is a martyr in that respect, something that he seemed to learn reading books about Zola and, and working in the Borinage. Or is he a, a martyr in another sense that he, he does cut off his own ear and he does commit suicide? I mean, in, in what sense is he a martyr? Because both of those are a kind of martyrdom, if that makes sense. So I just want to see if I can show you the picture he did of um, Paul Gauguin, Christ in Geth. I think this is this is the one. So So I'm going to show you this picture. Um, yeah, you've got a figure. It's supposed to be Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's got very bright orange hair, an orange beard. And some people say that this is Gauguin. This is, in a way, a self-portrait of Gauguin. In other words, that Gauguin sees himself as a messianic figure. In other words, he's saying it's both a self-portrait and a representation of Jesus about to be taken by the soldiers, right? Um, I'm just trying to see... I'm trying to see if there's any literature about whether he actually saw um, this figure as Van Gogh, because we know Van Gogh had kind of orange hair. Paul Gauguin definitely didn't have orange hair. So what's going on here? I just want to see if I can find something. I don't want to like... Um, I don't want to make a claim um, without being, without referencing it. Let's see if I can find it. Um, Gauguin.
Yeah, I can't really find anything like that, but um, I think it's quite interesting nonetheless. Um, one of the interpretations of it is that um, Gauguin's belief that he, like Christ, would ultimately perish for the salvation and betterment of his contemporaries. So he kind of seems to be representing himself as a very self-sacrificial figure, which I'm not sure if I agree with. Anyway, we let's move on to the next letter. So, so what do you guys think? Um, do you think that there were many? Well, let me let me ask the question like this: How many letters do you think were there between Van Gogh and Gauguin in 1889? So, in other words, following the air incident, how many letters would you guess there were between these two artists, roughly? What do you guys think? Jalsi says the painting does look like Gauguin. Yeah, it does. I, I do agree with that. I don't know whether I'm thinking of another another picture. Only one that I can remember that that had this Christ figure with orange hair. Why does he make his hair orange? So Cornelius says three or four, Larnus is ten, Malstilus is two. Well, the answer is really not a lot. It's, it's something like two or three. So in other words, there are one or two letters in January saying, can you send me my fencing equipment? And bear in mind, Van Gogh says to him, did you really, was it really necessary for my brother to have to come and see you? Was that really necessary, right? Um, which, which makes you already think that Gauguin did something that was kind of unauthorized, that he went behind the one brother's back to, to speak to the other brother. And Vincent didn't really approve of it. He didn't really like that. Um, and then nothing happens for the whole year. It's not like they carry on like pals. The, the beginning part is Vincent trying to convince his brother that they're still friends. But I mean, actually they're not. In reality, they're not still friends. And they then write to one another again in November. And let's just have a look. It's a letter from Paul Gauguin to Van Gogh in November. I, I must apologize because I sort of feel like when I compiled this research, I had all my ducks in a row. And I knew what I wanted to, the point I wanted to make. And I sort of feel like I've just jumped out of the analysis of, like I've been doing John A. Ramsey, and then I've been doing the, the Watts house and the house in Idaho. And I've just like gone from the one office to the other and like just thinking it would all slot into place. And I just sort of feel like, um, I'm a little bit um, fuzzy. I'm not quite on the ball that I, that I was on when I put all this re research together. Um, it, it could be the that that there's this letter that Paul writes almost a year later. You know, he wants his fencing supplies back in the beginning. Or he wants his fencing equipment sent back in the beginning. And then once he's got it, well, then he's done with Van Gogh. But then he does write to him again um, at the end of the year. Vincent doesn't write to him. He writes to Vincent. 
so I guess my argument is in the beginning, Vincent is trying to keep the show on the road because he wants the yellow house to continue. And then once he loses the yellow house, he's got no incentive really anymore. Anyway, let's just um, see what he says here. But then again, he says, um, my dear Vincent, I received your letter the other day. Anyway, so that's just not quite sure what. Um, anyway, let's let's just go through the letter. So he says, my dear Vincent, I received your letter the other day, and I'm pleased to see that you recovered. If it's not forever, at least for a long time, a time during which you're going to be able to work. No, I wasn't able to see your latest canvas. Now, bear in mind, at this point, the world fairs come and gone. Uh, and uh, I don't really know this for a fact, but I assume Paul Gauguin participated in it or benefited from it. And of course, Vincent has been in the asylum the entire year. Then he says, no, I wasn't able to see your latest canvas, having been in Brittany for a long time. But De Haan, the Dutchman who's with me, received a letter from a friend telling him that your new canvases were really something very artistic and more imaginative than the others. I'm pleased that you remember our conversation about drawing and De Haan, who has listened to me on that score. He has made real progress here in this regard. I have little news to give you about our friends as I myself am a little isolated from everything. Laval is in Paris, Bernard in saint Briac. Bernard Gauguin did not know that Bernard had returned to Paris. His father has totally forbidden him to be in pont Arvin with me. You will doubtless remember the bourgeois letter, bourgeois letter from the angry fellow. So that's another very obtuse reference to all of this drama. Let's see if we can see this letter. We'll see if we can open it in a moment. Okay, it's, we're not going to be able to see it. Anyway, Bernard writes to me sometimes. He has greatly changed for the better. And as an artist, he continues to... Um, to do curious and beautiful things. It isn't the same for me. I have an unfortunate nature which is thirsty for new things. I, I can't stop myself carrying out new researches. This year, I've done work completely different from last year, preparatory work for a thing that I glimpse as important. At your place in all, I did a painting a little in that direction, the grape harvest, a painting you did the drawing of. A woman seated, binds in a red triangle. That's this one. I don't know, th this woman kind of looks like a cat. Her face kind of looks like a cat. Anyway. In this order of abstract ideas, I'm led to seek synthetic form and color. As little craft as possible, and here and there secondary motifs, very lightly executed, to allow the impression of a figure all its power and not to fall into trifleness, childishness. Trifles, childishness. In front of me, I have several etchings, reproductions of paintings, etc., by Rembrandt, and I find a lot of these things in there. In the one you have, the detailed angel's head and the rest unfinished. It seemed to me that it was a standpoint. Do you notice that Gauguin is very interested to some extent in religious motifs, like he'll paint Christ or whatever, Christ on the cross, himself as a messianic figure. But 
Go, but Van Gogh doesn't really do that. Go, Van Gogh might well, is far more subtle in that approach. He'll paint a sower. Um, he'll paint something like Starry Night that is magical, but he doesn't really paint things in an overtly Christian way, right? Whereas Gauguin does, and then Gauguin also has these hedonistic... Um, uh, what do you call it? Um, he has this sort of a hedonistic phase, if you know what I mean. It it it, it seems very um, con. It seems very mixed up, if you know what I mean. You know, it's it's um, kind of antagonistic. Right, it's not. This it, it seems incompatible, right? What does Landis say? Okay. Okay, let's continue here. Um, Then he says, and there's no reason why, because I'm not a master, I shouldn't enter into the order of ideas of a master like that, one with different applications. All this, my dear Vincent, leads me to being shouted at in Paris, and I feel that they're wrong. This year I've made incredible efforts in work and reflection, and still it's as if I've rested. At home I have a thing I haven't sent, and which would suit you, I think. It's Christ in the Garden of Olives, blue, green, sky, dusk, trees all bent into purple, ground violet, and Christ wrapped in a dark ochre garment, has vermilion hair. As this canvas isn't destined to be understood, I'm keeping it for a long time. Included is this drawing, which will give you a vague idea of it. Well, that's the one that we looked at. So here he's actually referring Van Gogh to that particular picture. And he doesn't really say, he talks about vermilion hair. He doesn't say that it's a self-portrait or, or anything else. Anyway, we, Dehan and I have settled ourselves in for work and calm. Beside the sea, I found a large house which is rented out for only two months for sea bathing. Because of that, I got it very cheaply for the winter. The upper part is an immense terrace, 15 meters by 12 and 5 meters high, glazed on two sides. On one side, we plunge over an immense sea horizon. The storms are magnificent and we paint them directly from the studio right in the midst of the sensation of the terribleness of the waves striking black rocks. On the other side, red sands, fields, and a few farms surrounded by their trees. Models every day of women, men, uh, men coming to herd the cows or gather the seaweed from the sea. You can pose them as you wish for a franc. You can see that there's everything one needs here to work. Beside us, we have a little inn where we eat very well, not expensively. That deals with the material side. So this is all, um, what's the word? This is all um, in contrast, essentially rivaling the situation at the Yellow House. This is where Gauguin prefers to be rather than all, right? Le, le Puldu. Let, let's see if we can just get a quick glimpse of Le Puldu. Looks quite nice. This is what Le Puldu looks like.
and uh, here is some more. Here's the Wikipedia reference to it. I'm not quite sure where it is on that map. That's not really showing us very much. Let's see if I can get a bit, bit more on that. Looks like the sort of place I wouldn't mind visiting. Look at that. Isn't that pretty? Looks like looks really um, quite something. I want to go to Le Poudou. Here's another version of it. So that's where um, Gauguin is, is happier. Here's another picture of it. Quite a nice spot, don't you guys agree? Um, maybe maybe a better spot than all. So I've been to all. I haven't been to Le Poldu. I think I might need to go to Le, Le Poldu. Okay, so let's wrap up this letter. Um, where are we now? Where were we? Just a bit confused. Got so many things open here. Um, definitely not that one. Sorry, guys, I'm a little bit. Uh, oh, there it is. Okay. Um, then he says, De Haan has completely set himself to work in our direction. He's getting along very well without losing his personality. And I promise you that now he understands Rembrandt better than before, as well as um, the Dutch masters. With the old masters, there's an intellectual bond that links them all together. And by doing as they do, one succeeds in doing something else. There's a paradox, but I understand myself. For two months, I've been working on a large sculpture of painted wood, and I dare believe that it's the best thing I've done up to now as regards power and harmony. But the literary side to it is, it is insane to many. A monster who looks like me is taking the hand of a naked woman. That's, so he says, a monster who looks like me is taking the hand of a naked woman. That's the main subject. The top part, a town, some sort of Babylon, the bottom, the countryside, with a few imagined flowers, an old and desolate woman and a fox, the fateful animal of perversity for the Indians. So that seems to be the sculpture that he's doing. Um, I guess that's the monster. Interesting. Okay. Uh, it's difficult to give you the feel of it with the drawing. You have to see the color of the wood marrying with the background painted green, yellow oak, and yellow flowers. Golden hair, a few greenish figures. For despite the inscription, the people look sad in contradiction to the title. On this waxed wood, there are reflections where the light hits the parts in relief, imparting richness. So it, it seems that he does do a sketch. Well, there's the Christ figure. Quite a lot of detail went into this letter. Then he says, I'm going to send it to Paris in a few days. Perhaps it'll be, it'll please people more than anything. Dehan sends his kind regards. Yours cordially, P. Gorgan, Paul Gorgan. P.S. I know you become tired when you write, so don't, so I don't ask you for a letter, despite all the pleasure I have in reading you. 
Bernard's military service has been put back a year for help. Okay. So obviously when we deal with this letter, we, we've skipped basically through an entire year. Um, and it's a very painful, slow, horrible year. You know, it's, it's a year where Van Gogh um, basically loses everything. He loses his ear, he loses his home. Um, you could argue that he loses his mind or that, that he's certainly struggling with his sanity. I think a lot of people, no matter how sane, would, would, would be stretched to the limit in a situation like that. And so, yeah, so by, by dealing with this, we've really just jumped just by, by looking at the letters between Gauguin and Van Gogh, we, we sort of jumped across 1889. And of course, that is a huge disservice to Van Gogh because that is the year that he produces um, Starry Night. And um, he, de he kind of demonstrates his resilience. You know, although he is loses everything he still manages to kind of hold it together and then he emerges in 1890 goes to Orvez and begins this campaign in that final summer of his life so um from um van gogh letters 71 we're gonna slowly continue that journey you know van gogh letters from now now on is gonna take us into really the nightmare of Van Gogh's, um, uh, what's the word, um, th that episode in the asylum. And, and I think it's both, um, it's kind of like that movie, The Shawshank Redemption. It, it's both um, horrible, this horrible nightmare, but then there, there's also this, this incredible hope that he manages to hold on to despite his um this horrible place that he finds himself in so in that sense it's a, it is also an incredible story if you just take the the 1889 phase we i mean bear in mind he admits himself into the asylum and then he also decides i'm ready to leave the asylum um you know th there's something quite incredible about that um journey as well that that he arrives at the asylum really a broken man there's no doubt about it and then he emerges out of the asylum oh, i'm not going to say a fixed man but certainly a stronger person someone who decides you know what i'm i, I want to have a, a better life i'm going to go i'm going to do this and i want to go there and, and i'm going to have a better life and kudos to him for for trying i mean he could easily just say you know what this art thing didn't work i'm gonna go back to all and and just sweep the streets or i'm gonna just um drink or whatever it is you know he continued painting and uh, you know that that is kind of a level of consistency that i don't know how many artists would be able to um what's the word, stick to, given what he was going through. So it really is pretty incredible. Uh, yeah, he does write to Theo. Um, the, the, the letters are quite erratic in 1889, but they do write to one another. So we are going to be dealing with that in Van Gogh letters, um, 71, 72, 73. Um, there's some months where he writes fairly frequently and then there's some months where he just doesn't write at all where he does seem to be overcome by his circumstances you know he is lonely he is um hurt by what has happened let's see if i can quickly show you um what i'm talking about so this is kind of a schematic of the letters, and you can see is 1889. There are quite a few letters in January. Then in February, just five. And and then it's sort of, 
up and down. They're, they're just three letters in uh, in July. Um, I mean, it's, it's really not no letters. It's just far less than in 1888, which is the, the sort of maximum output. So we've we've still we've got quite a lot of work ahead of us to, to get through 1889. But you can see by around about the middle of 1889, he is not in a, a very happy space. Uh, thanks a lot, Chelsea. Thank you, and and thank you for your buying that that T-shirt. I really appreciate your. Um, interest in you know being part of this community so i'm gonna um we've passed like an hour and a half I, i'm now going to take the conversation to quite a grave place and yeah um hopefully um hopefully there's going to be a bit of a takeout for you guys um let's, let me just bring back this picture Okay, so a couple of nights ago, I actually recorded my thoughts on this, and and then I just decided I wasn't going to post it onto Patreon just because I felt like I, I didn't really want to deal with all the condolences and so on. I just felt like it's going to be a bit too much to bear. So... Um, so, so this is this is a little bit of a story. With spring, obviously, there's new life, and this little baby giraffe was born. Um, you know, there's new life, and outside my balcony window, um, up until recently, there were six nests from the the weaver. Um, I, I've taken some photos, but I've just uh, been really overworked. Um, I'll tell you why in a second. Um, I've also took quite a few photos um, at the farm, uh, but I, like I say, I, I didn't really get to see the giraffe while I was there. And um, yeah, something really tragic happened. Um, so my father told me that that there was this baby giraffe. I went to the farm with my camera to take a photo of it. Um, twice, on the one instance, the um, the uh, I didn't see any giraffe at all, and then on the other instance, I really went looking for them and went into the the brush and eventually found the female. Didn't see the baby, but I thought, look, she's probably just trying to protect her, her youngster, um, and I'm going to kind of butt out. Now the sad part is that. During this, during this um, period, the the male giraffe disappeared, and it was a little bit of a mystery. It was a little bit like I mean, my father said to me, um, "We just don't know where it is," and I said to him, "Well, there, there are only two possibilities: either it fell into the river." or um, someone came there with a truck and caught it and drove away. And I said, the second, the second possibility is extremely unlikely because it's just very unlikely. You know, it would mean someone taking the risk of going there, breaking the locks, being seen, you know, you don't just catch a giraffe like that. Um, and uh, so I said, uh, you know, that's the other possibility. My father went there with a um, drone operator and and I just couldn't find the giraffe. And I said, you know, giraffes don't just disappear. Um, so either must have fallen in the river, which would account for you not seeing it, or um, someone came there and took it, which would explain why you can't see it. Um, but it's very unlikely that someone did come and take it, right? And so 
Another day passed, and then my father said he found the giraffe in the river. And I, I don't know, I just find it extremely heartbreaking because I, I'm pretty sure when I was there looking for the giraffes, probably the male giraffe was in the river. It may actually have been alive then, and, and I suppose I could have saved it. I, you know, if I'd, if I'd looked harder, I could possibly have found it still alive in the river and, and we could have saved its life. Um, but I sort of felt like because there's a baby, maybe I need to sort of respect their privacy. But, uh, you know, when you think so, so uh, let me give you guys a little bit more context. When it's winter here, the water levels drop to some extent in the river. We have like dry winters. And so the giraffe is obviously bending down, the male giraffe was bending down further than it would normally bend because the water levels dropped. And so that is why it fell into the river. And so when it fell into the river, it's not like it fell into the river and then drowned immediately. It fell into the river and then it couldn't get out. You know, the embankment was too steep. So it literally was a situation where he fell into the river and then he was still, you know, able, his, his neck, his head and probably shoulders would have stuck out the water and he would have been alive, but, it, but unable to get out the river. And so now it's a situation that he's in the river, stuck in the river, but he can't eat anything. And now he's also going to be exposed in the sense of the waters. It's not below freezing, but it's certainly not warm. And so probably the, the, this giraffe came to a very, uh, you know, the, this giraffe's life came to a very horrible ending. It probably was about four or five days that it was um, in this river, unable to get out unable to eat anything and then that that is how and why it died and so it's just um yeah so i am um, first of all i feel really horrible that that i couldn't have you know that i i was actually there during this period like i literally haven't been to my father's farm for months and so at the time that i was there i was there for uh, probably three times during the, this period when all of this happened, just coincidentally, I literally could have um, um, you know, if I'd, if I'd just been a bit more curious, I guess, um, because I, I probably did spend easily an hour looking, uh, looking for the giraffe, just expecting them, because how hard is it to find a giraffe? You know, they're, they're, they're big animals. And I, I did find one giraffe in the end, and, I, and, I, and, I, and then I just left it at that point. And I just feel really bad that I, I could potentially have saved its life. The other thing that I, I kind of feel angry about is I did say to my father, because I paddled along the river and I said, you know what, it, the, I paddled all along the river and I said, you know, that the embankment is quite steep all along the river. And I, I said to him, you really need to kind of make a beach. And he kind of dismissed the whole thing and just said, no, um, the animals will figure it out themselves. And so, so this is what's happened. So I also feel a little bit angry that, um, about that, I feel a little bit angry about that. So, so I don't know, there's a little bit of a, um, an analogy um, in Van Gogh losing his ear over Christmas. In other words, you have, and, and then his brother getting engaged, you kind of have this, this sort of fairy tale with a nightmare, right? He loses his ear, he loses something, he loses his friend, he loses his future in a way. Meanwhile, at the same time that that's happening, his brother is getting engaged and kind of getting his fairy tale. And, the, uh, and I often say that, that, that often at the time that, that, that 
someone is going through a nightmare, someone else is having a fairy tale. And I, and I think part of it, part of the reason for this is because you're so distracted by your fairy tale, you don't really notice someone else's nightmare, right? And so by the same token, at the same time that spring happens, certainly here in South Africa, this little baby giraffe is born and now it's, it's, its father's just died. Um, it's it's part of nature, I guess, but it, it certainly is really cruel, it is really um, horrible. You know, and, um, you can sit in your chair watching this and I can sit here and we can talk about it, but you know, it's a very real giraffe that I, that I saw and I captured on my camera, on my phone, um, days before it died. I mean, there it was walking in front of the sun, uh, a real animal, you know, all um, whatever, 18 foot of it. And for that animal then to fall into the river and, and then just slowly lose its life just is, it just uh, is, is quite monstrous as far as I'm concerned. And so I've kind of been um, having this really unpleasant um, thought and unpleasant reality kind of in the back of my mind the last couple of days. Um, yeah. So I just kind of wanted to share that with you and then share something that takes it all a step further. And that is, um, yeah, um, it's going to sound very um, like the antithesis of Team Peachtree. Team Peachtree is supposed to be about um, the joy of living. Uh, it's supposed to be about, um, you know, life being fruitful and springing forth. And it is for the most part. But I just want to share something with you. Um, uh, I was swimming the other day. Um, I don't want I don't want this to be too heavy, but it, I guess it is quite a heavy subject. Uh, I was swimming the other day, and um, um, so I was I was doing a really hard uh, hundred meter set, and while I was swimming, the set, you know, you reach that point where your body is screaming for air, you know, and you you're pushing really hard. And you're aware that you're pushing very hard, but your body's screaming for air. And it happens to, to me sometimes um, that I'll have the, like the, these very negative, extremely negative thoughts um, while I'm in this physically compromised situation. And so this literally happened on this particular set. I was on the last length, it was 100 meters in a 25 meter pool. And while I was approaching the last 10, 15 meters, as I said, my body's screaming for, for air and, 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 you know, you've got this you're in, in extreme oxygen debt. And meanwhile, the thoughts in my mind was basically, well, um, in terms of your life, th there's no way out. In other words, whether you finish, you can finish this set, but uh, no matter what you do, no matter how you live, whether you're rich or poor, whether you live a good life or a bad life, you, you're going to drown. You know, there's no way out of of life. There's no way to avoid death, no matter what you do, which is which is a lot like drowning. Um, no matter how excruciating your need to to survive, no matter how, no, regardless of the effort you put into it, you're going to effectively drown you're gonna run out of life you're gonna run out of breath whatever and um, despite th these incredibly negative thoughts which made it even harder to breathe and harder to finish that particular uh, set um, I, I kind of hit the wall and then I and it's not a bad time and then I felt like I really needed to deal with this thought and I've, I've had it before and I've often had it as a, as a kid swimming. Um, but anyway, and this is what I want to share with you. It is a, it is a very um, austere thing to think. And 
what I want to share with you is the realistic, um, what's the word? The, the realistic way that you deal with that question. And this is what I came up with. So I was not in a very good place. You know, I could easily just have gotten out the pool and dried myself off and gone home. But I just sort of thought, you know what, you need to deal with the psychology. You need to think it through. And, and so I thought, um, in, in, in summary, I basically just thought, what is it? So, you know, what is death like? Right. And so what, what, what did it feel like for you or for me or for, or for someone else not to be around in 1888 or 1762 or the year 1219 and the answer is you're not there to to know what it's like one way or the other in other words when you're not alive you're not conscious to know what you're missing right and so that's what death's like as far as i'm concerned when you when you're not alive you not it's like being asleep so so the, the the real issue isn't death. It is how you think about death when you're alive. In other words, death itself isn't really a big deal. It's how you think about death when you're alive. And so bringing it back to swimming and running out of air, um, that's where you basically say, you know what, I actually need to test myself and test this feeling of I can't breathe. I need to practice overcoming it. I need to practice not having breath and, and being okay with it. Um, because that's part of life. And does that make sense? And that death actually isn't anything to fear. Dying, yes, but death itself isn't really anything to fear. You're not there to to um, experience it. So yeah, that, that's exactly what, what I'm saying. So, yeah, I mean, this is pretty dark stuff, uh, not only the giraffe, but what I've just said to you, but there is something that I think is quite illuminating and quite hopeful that comes out of it, where you say, um, you know, you need to figure out how to live, and part of why you do need to do that is because we are going to die one day. You don't just postpone those thoughts, you need to deal with those thoughts. And so, you know, spring is springing in South Africa. And in terms of that, I'm, um, I'm going to be taking a little bit of time off. Um, part of the reason why I'm feeling really overworked right now is I've been trying to make multiple videos a day so that while I'm on holiday, they can sort of publish while I'm not making videos. Because I, I don't want to go on holiday and work. I want to kind of make sure that that there's some days that I just don't work at all. And um, for a workaholic, that, that can be quite difficult. But I, I do want to just, um, I've been, you know, when we were reading about Gauguin and the rocks and the surf, well, that's exactly where I'm going to be. And I'm taking this dude with. Um, but, um, yeah, it's just been quite unpleasant working twice and three times as hard in the run up to that um, so that when I'm away, um, I can, you know, try and rest properly. Um, and that is something I want to kind of do more often is uh, take full days off where you're not online, you're not making a video, you're not looking at numbers um, where you are living, right? And I want to kind of be doing that um, more often. Um, I have set certain goals and I'm quite competitive. And so that's kind of kept me um, rolling along more than I meant to. But uh, this little trip, it's purposefully coinciding with spring because I, I kind of want to come alive myself a little bit. And um, so, yeah, so I'm just letting you guys know, you know, part of my t Team Petri community that um, I'm going to be going offline for a couple of days. 
And when you see me again, I'll be at the sea and I'll be I'll, I'll be saying hi to you guys from from the coast. So um, yeah, so so that's that's happening. Thanks a lot, Chelsea. Thanks. Yeah, living, you might say living is scarier than dying, but um, I think if you had to ask that giraffe, would you rather be alive than what happened to you? I think it's, I'd rather be alive. I am going with Timmy. You'll be happy to hear about that. What, what I find so incredible about Van Gogh's life is that last summer, um, you know, really, because I went to Orvez, I, I went to um, the, the wheat field with, with crows, there were crows in it, and um, it was a wonderful place to be, Just and I was there for like three or four days, he was there for 70 days, um, really was a wonderful place, and it was Nothing like the setting in 1890, which, which would have been a very farmyard-like setting, but it was nevertheless very quaint when I was there. Lynn Lippi says, hard thoughts to consider, but you are dealing with them properly by contemplating them. I'm glad you're taking a break with Timmy. Yeah, thanks. I was kind of just waiting for um, the weather, because some I've been, uh, how can I say this? Sometimes the weather um, can be rain, 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 rain. And so I, I wanted to choose wisely uh, when I went. So. That's the idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I was actually saying this to my ex-partner in crime, Lisa. Um, she's actually just lost a friend. Uh, it's on her Instagram. But I was just saying to her, um, you know, um, what she thinks about, isn't it time for me to move on from true crime? Um, and I, I don't really know what the answer is to that. I don't know whether it means completely on, like where you do something completely different. Uh, maybe you cover mountain climbing or triathlon or um, nature or something, or whether you just um, change the amount of 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 it. I don't know. Um, not quite sure. I may come back from my trip um, refreshed and and ready for more. But um, there's another part of me that's that's thinking about a more serious and more fundamental change. I know when I was in America, I was also thinking of making kind of bigger changes and, and, and part of the, the Team Petri channel is kind of part of that idea and it's not really about money or subscribers, it's more about, um, it's more like just a, what do you call it, um, an, append, an appendage to living in a certain way. In, in other words, it's, you know, it's like if you go and climb a mountain uh, you come back with a summit photo, but there's a much bigger experience around it, right? Um, Lana says, enjoy your time off. We all need to try to be a human being and not just a human doing, yeah. Um, I, I, I was saying to a friend of mine, I'm very good at being very single-minded and having a very single-minded focus, but I'm not that good at balancing things like socializing, fitness, but like quite a high level of fitness, um, family and work. Like I'm not very good at balancing all of those things. Um, because 
in a way it means you've got to lower your standards or it feels to me like you have to you've got to lower your standards in the one area in order to make more time for the other thing so i don't know but i, I do feel like that's something i want to work on uh, my friend alex was really really good at that he was he, he could perform at such a high level good family man um, professional businessman um excellent sportsman you know and and, and um yeah I, I just find i've got to i need a really single-minded focus to be happy with what i'm doing in a particular area whether it's sport or work or whatever um so i, I do feel like things are a little bit out of balance for me and i've got to think about what balance means to me you know, i've got to think about that and now spring is a kind of a good time to think about that like how, what amount of work is appropriate what amount of this or that or that is appropriate and um yeah you know i mean i'm especially aware of it because i'm in my 50s and i sort of feel like at 60 your life's not over but it's anyway from 50 to 60 there's there's um, an opportunity to, to to do a lot and to be fairly active not saying 60s like um the end um send me to the asylum i'm just saying that between 50 and 60 you can still be quite physically com competitive and you can do certain things um that that you probably couldn't do as much after 60. and so i sort of feel like i really want to make the most of my 50s especially after writing away my 40s so that's kind of the thing that i'm also quite aware of i sort of am asking myself where do i want to be in the world but i mean like literally geographically where do i want to be uh, where should i spend my time like in a given year, where should I, where should I spend my time? Um, and it's kind of a difficult question. Um, it's kind of a difficult question. I am, yeah. yeah I mean, this giraffe, this giraffe is like this huge animal. And for it to die the way that it died, just makes you realize we are giraffes too we could fall in the mud as well we could things would come to an unhappy ending as well for us you know uh when you say ct do you mean connecticut yeah i must say um I really don't like serial killers isn't something I want to be doing a lot because they are they tend to be particularly depraved I mean they really have an anal attitude to life and to get to know that attitude kind of contaminates you with it I'm not saying you become a serial killer but you certainly become um aware of that very um dark energy and I'm not sure if that's something I want to be spending too much time doing, you know. Okay, um, that I think that's it from me. We passed the two-hour mark. Uh, I need to get some sleep because I've got to be um, up and running tomorrow. So, yeah. But anyway... Um, watch this space um we cover travel on the team peachtree channel so i'll be updating you guys when i'm not updating um but i mean it'll just be easy by the way this is where i am kind of thing um so um look out for that i hope i hope my sunny vistas uh coastal scenes awaken the vagabond spirit in you guys um and and yeah um hopefully we, hopefully um the joy of living will be shared 
<laughs> uh, Schneiderlein says, thank you very much for this great live stream. Thank you. Um, cool. Jolf, I'm uh, really glad to see you here. And thanks a lot for your little Instagram. I appreciate it. Um, okay. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, and um, Timmy's going to say goodbye. Um, I'll try and do uh, another Van Gogh Letters on Van Gogh's Letters, episode 71. Um, yeah, I'm going to say before the end of the month. So um, that'll give me, I'm, I'm pretty certain it'll be uh, maybe the, the second last Sunday of the month. Um, I don't want to like let months and months and months go by, but um, Timmy, are you sleepy? Timmy, are you sleepy? Hmm. But anyway, we want to do at least two episodes a month so that we keep the continuity, certainly of Van Gogh letters. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Timmy and I are going to find a polo. Hey, Timmy. Sleepy. Okay, I, I thought I would just uh, treat you guys to a little um, soprano from Timmy. How was that? Okay, guys, take care, and I'll see you guys next time. All the best. Stay strong.